to why seed is so valuable to the conversation about food. Um, I think when I look at this room and know where you're all kind of coming from related to agriculture, I think there's probably an awareness about seed because uh, you have to order seeds. You have to plant seeds. You have this greater awareness than maybe the general public does. But what we want to do is kind of shift that even deeper for those that aren't quite there yet and recognize that the origin of our seeds uh, is going to be as important as the origin of our food. And so um, we want to kind of uncover some possible mysteries to you about seed. We want to talk about some practical applications so it doesn't have to be this scary word, genetics, and so that we can open up genetics to this greater conversation and figuring out what they are and where we all kind of individually and hopefully together figure out where that line is that we want to be when it comes to the terms genetics and comes to the term seed and how we can uh, involve all of ourselves in the process of what seed we're going to choose. I think one of the most amazing parts about seed is very much that, is the choice that's associated with and the relationship that's associated with it. So every seed is a thread of history in some way, even if it's just this year, right? It's this year saved for next year. It's the passing of the torch. And then it's also seed as history that can tie back generations and generations and generations. So to me, seed is kind of this binding factor that passes through all of us. And so we want to touch on that and kind of showcase where, where we are, where we've been, where we are right now with seed, and thinking about where we can be when it comes to seed in the future. And the last thing I'd say that ties to that is this idea that the choice is so important and that the power of everybody making a choice kind of together or collectively figuring out where our stance is on seed and the importance of seed is going to lead to the higher quality seed of the future and going to lead to what's going to be on our plates and in our bodies too. So all these things are going to come together in this presentation, hopefully. Um, setting we, up for some setting it up. So what we want to do too, so uh, we'll all introduce ourselves now so you know why we're even talking about seed. Um, but this, you know, we're going to have presentations eventually and they're going to be very pretty. The pictures are going to be phenomenal. But we want to keep it open. We want to keep it conversational because really the best way to learn is if we're engaged in learning uh, with each other. So I will say that I am feeling very grateful to be here with these two, with Amy and Adrian, to be able to answer some of these questions that come up. And I'd fill in as well to answer things related to uh, farming and seeds and that kind of stuff. But um, so we really want to use this time together to get the most out of it. That's the goal. The, getting through the presentations isn't the goal of this. The goal is to get as much as we can out of it. So yeah, very excited to be here. And uh, we're excited to, to jump in. So if we could start with some intros, who, who we are. Um, I guess I should start, so I'll, <laughs> I'll go. Uh, my name is somewhere here on the tag. No, uh, I'm Jason Grauer. I'm the crop production manager at Stone Barns here at the farm at Stone Barns. So I'm managing our vegetable production. And so within that, it's figuring out the day-to-day -day flow of the production schedule. What are we going to grow? When are we going to grow it? That kind of thing. Moving the crew. But those decisions aren't made by me. Those decisions are made by the soil, and they're made by the time of year, and all these decisions that, that play out. So my job is to figure out, to be a liaison between all of the customers, the distribution, where's everything going, and all of the seed choices that we're going to make. So connecting with all the seed breeders, the university breeders, the seed companies, anybody related to seed, including the seed that we're saving here on the farm, and figuring out where that all fits into the place. So I get to be a liaison in that sense. Um, and we do a lot of work here at Stone Barns related to seeds. So the soil is our foundation. But once we have that set, our real goal then is we feel like genetics are really an important thing to discuss and to know and find a place for. So it's about figuring out the right seed for the right place. I'm Adrienne Shelton. I work for Vitalis Organic Seeds, uh, which is a breeding and seed production company. And I'll get more into what we do at Vitalis in a little bit. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I've been working in the organic seed world for probably about a dozen years or so in various capacities. Um, and I'm really passionate about seeds. So I'm excited to have this conversation with you guys today. My name's uh, Amy Grondon, and I'm a commercial fisherman. And I live in Port Townsend, Washington, and fish the coast of Washington as well as southeast Alaska. 
Uh, and when I'm not on the water, I work in uh, sustainable food systems advocacy and um, outreach with commercial fishermen and organic growers and farmers. Um, I'm really happy to be here as well. Awesome. Oh, I forgot one thing. Um, I'm one of the fellows from the 2018 cohorts uh, here at Stone Park. So. And a board member of? And a board <laughs> member of Organic Seed Alliance as well. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. So okay. I think we'll, we'll yeah. kick things off with Adrian taking us through this industry. See how we can uh, get this to work. Doesn't seem to be going. Gene, what'd you do? <laughs> it's not going. Any piece of clickers? Or is it back? Should we be using the clipper? Did you change something? Yeah, the clicker doesn't work. It wasn't, the arrows weren't working? Yeah, to start. There we go. Ah, got it. There we go. Okay. Okay. So, right, I'm going to start us off by just talking a little bit about organic seed and why it's um, an important part of organic seed systems. Um, sort of give you a super brief history of seed companies and seed development in the U.S. Talk, and then talk a little bit more about how seed gets to you and into, into your farm. So um, to go into a little bit more of the complexities of it so you can understand more about, um, make better informed choices as you're, as you're looking through your seed catalogs and trying to decide what to put plant on your farm. So, um, you know, organic food really begins with organic seed and, and I think when I was working on um, organic farms um, about 15 years or so ago, you know, this time of year was, I was up in the Northeast, so this time of year was cold out and it was fun to look through all the seed catalogs, figure out what you were gonna put, in on, put on your farm that year. And that, you know, and that was sort of the extent of it. And then of course a lot more of my time and energy went into figuring out how my production system was gonna work, what, who was gonna buy the food, all these things. Um, and so it's this really little piece of the production system, but it actually has a lot of implications for the, the larger scale of agriculture that um, when I was first starting farming, I didn't really even give much thought to. Um, so when you think about organic seed and how that seed is produced, you know, um, most of the organic seed or the seed that is produced is produced in conventional production. And when you think about a seed crop that's being grown in the ground, that seed is often, those plants are often in the ground for a lot longer than um, your typical lettuce plant or your broccoli plant in order to get it to seed that can be harvested. And so um, when, in, when those seeds are being grown for <coughs> seed, um, there's a lot more pests that can infect that plant. There's a lot more weed pressures that come along. And so um, there's actually a lot more um, intensive chemicals that are used in seed production even than in what you think of as, as vegetable production often to get that seed to maturity. Um, and so when you're buying organic seed, you're buying seed that has been produced um, according to the guidelines of the USDA NOP program. And so um, it's being grown in a way that, you know, is often, you know, very similar to the philosophy of how you're trying to grow on your farm. Um, because seed crops are not food crops, a lot more intensive chemistry can be used in conventional production that can be, than can be used in something like a conventional broccoli production that's going to be eaten. And so when you're, when you're choosing organic seed, um, not only are you, you, you know, you're choosing varieties that might be better adapted to your farm, but you're also choosing seed then that has been produced in a way that's much more environmentally friendly than a lot of the conventionally produced seed that's out there. Um, another thing to think about is that... You can be my clicker. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then I can see what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, the other thing is that, you know, organic growers really require, in some ways they require similar traits as conventional growers in the varieties that they're growing, but often they also require different traits than conventional growers because, as we all know, an organically, an organic system or sustainably managed system 
um, has a lot of differences than a conventionally managed system. Um, and so um, because of that, there's, there's um, a very common term that is used in the breeding world, which is G by E, or genotype by environment. And that means that when you take a variety that has a, you know, a certain genome and you place it in one environment, it's going to produce differently than if you take that same variety and place it in a totally different system. And, and how those traits are expressed is going to be different depending on what environment it's placed in. So if you think about a conventional agriculture system where um, there's a lot of readily um, available nutrients that um, have been applied, um, there's you know, um, the ability to use various forms of weed suppression and other um, chemistries to help with pests and pathogens, that plant is going to perform differently than when you put that plant in an organic system where maybe the fertility is a different system. It's based on a more slow release system based on compost. Um, there's different weed management strategies or different pathogen and pest strategies. And so organic growers really require um, varieties that um, are adapted to those organic production systems, whether that's nutrient um, efficiency, being able to scavenge for um, nutrients in the soil, um, you know, specific disease resistances, plant architectures to help with weed suppression, um, early vigor and maturity to get that crop grown and out of the ground as quickly as you can before all these um, pathogens have a chance to, to affect it. So that's another reason to think about the seed that you're growing and how it was bred um, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to impact how it's going to perform on your farm. Next. Um, and then finally, if you are um, growing in an organic system that's certified, it is a regulated input. Um, so according to the NOP, the National Organic Program, which sets the standards for organic agriculture, um, there is an organic seed usage requirement. Um, and so if, this, you know, if the seed that you want to plant on your farm is available organically, you are required to purchase that seed organically. Um, now, if, if the variety that you're looking for is not available organically or you can't find an equivalent organic variety, you certainly are allowed to, to, to plant conventional, um, conventionally grown seed. Um, but this regulation has been part of the NOP program since it started in 2002, and the regulations are getting tighter. And so this past fall at the um, NOSB meeting, which is the advisory council for the National Organic Program, um, <clears throat> they've changed some of the regulations saying that growers really have to show that they are um, making every attempt to um, increase their usage of organic seed on their farm. And so organic certifiers are going to start to be looking now more to show that year after year organic growers are actually, um, are, are actually making attempts to increase their, their percentage of organic seed usage on farm. Okay. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and just um, talk a little bit about how the organic seed industry has developed within the conventional seed industry um, that we have in the United States. Um, and you know, seed companies have been around since the United States was founded. Um, one of the oldest companies, corporate, incorporated companies in the United States was a seed company, Landris Seeds, which was incorporated in 1784. But it's really been the last 100 years or so when um, the seed industry has really developed, and then also we've seen a lot of changes, especially within the last 20 to 25 years. Um, and so a couple of the benchmarks. Um, one, it's just interesting to note that originally, um, before the, the turn of the 1900s, the USDA was actually the biggest distributor of seeds in the country. And they gave out free seeds to farmers for um, close to 100 years. And it was a very popular program, as you might imagine. But of course, as seed companies were developing, they, they didn't like to have to compete with this free seed that the US government was shipping out to everyone. Um, so that was sort of a fight, and that ended in 1920. The USDA now no longer gives out free seed in general, although we do have gene banks that, where you can access seed, um, which is an important resource. I won't be talking about that too much today, but um, they're not just sh you know, sending seed out. You know, I'm a farmer sending some seed. They don't do that anymore. You gotta, um, you know, there, but there's other ways that you can get your seed, which we'll be talking about today. 
Um, but anyway, in, around 1900 is when Mendel's laws of um, genetics were rediscovered. If you guys remember from your high school biology, the um, Punnett squares with the yellow, you know, the smooth peas and the wrinkled seeds or peas or the yellow peas and the green peas. And that's how we started to really understand sort of the foundations of genetics. This was still long before. Um, you know, we understood anything about DNA, but that was sort of the beginning of really figuring out, okay, how can we really actively improve our varieties? Um, then in the 1920s, hybrid corn was developed, and this was the first instance of um, a crop being developed using hybrids versus open pollinated seeds, um, and that was really a big, um, a big develop in, another, in a number of ways, but encouraged a lot of companies to get in, involved in, in seed production and seed selling. Um, and so then still from about the 1920s to the 1990s, you had this, just this real proliferation of small independent seed companies all over the country that were um, developing and distributing regional seeds for their areas. Um, and then that really shifted once GMOs came around, which happened about the 1990s. Um, and it really encouraged a lot of big companies that weren't originally involved in seeds to get interested in the seed industry because of um, the potential um, to um, patent varieties and then potentially make a lot of money um, that was other otherwise not really that possible before G GMOs came on the market. Um, so then you really started to see this consolidation in the seed industry. Um, which continues today. And now the sort of the newest thing that you might have heard of that a lot of people are talking about is gene editing, which is a whole new technology. And that also is having some implications in the seed industry. And so this is um, an image that's already quite out of date, even though it's five years old. And it just shows how um, the consolidation that has happened within the seed industry um, has, has really advanced rapidly. And already this is out of date. Um, where's that pointer? I think that pointer works still on this. Um, yeah, okay. Um, because this shows these large companies that off, many of them, which you know, started in the pharmaceutical or other industries when they got involved in the seed industry, um, started buying up all these smaller seeds. So all these small circles are smaller seed companies. And then um, in the middle are these big companies that now own all these companies. Um, so now this is Monsanto and this is Bayer, and these bon Bayer recently bought Monsanto, so this whole cluster is now one cluster. Um, DuPont, which was one, is the only um, company on here that um, originally started, well, I guess I couldn't even say that was Pioneer, but mostly they started in, um, well, I'm not going to say that, that's not accurate. Anyway, <laughs> forget all that. Um, DuPont and Dow are now joined, so these two big uh, clusters are together. Um, and now Syngenta is owned by a uh, Chinese company that's not even on this graph, and so they're owned by another conglomerate. So we're continuing to see um, a lot of consolidation in the seed industry. Um, but again, we're here to talk about all the other options that are out there. Um, so it's, it's not all bad news, but this is the, sort of the larger framework. Okay, so now to like sort of bring it back to I think what is more relevant for you all is, as far as okay, how do we, you know where do I fit in this giant um, cluster? How do I get my seeds, and where you know where are they really coming from? And so this is a diagram that I put together that I want to walk through um, because it's still there's still a lot of seed movement happening all over the place, and that's what um, what really I want to impart today is that you know when you're looking through those seed catalogs, um, there's those seeds are coming from all different places. And so it's worth it to really understand where that seed's coming, get to, getting to know your seed dealers, talking to them, asking questions. Hey, you know, where is this variety coming from? Um, what do you think about this? Because seed company, you know, they want to share that information, and that makes you informed as a grower, and it's going to help you to make the best choices for your farm. Um, so at the top of this um, diagram, are what I'm calling breeding and seed production companies. And so those are those, those big companies that were in that slide before, um, the Monsantos, the DuPonts, also companies that I, like what I work for, Vitalis Organic Seeds, Beijo Seeds, Reich Swan. Um, and so these companies, their main work is to develop new varieties and produce the seed of that varieties. But most of these companies are not distributing directly to farmers and growers. They're, they're distributing their seed to what I'm calling retail seed companies. And those are who 
the companies that you probably are most familiar with. It's Johnny Seeds, it's High Mowing Seeds, it's Seedway, it's Fruition, it's um, Territorial. I mean, there's a lot of seed companies in this category. And they're sort of really the hub in a lot of ways of the seed industry because they're taking seed from all these different locations and then they're distributing it to farmers and gardeners and also often to other companies as well. Um, so where are companies like, like a company like Johnny's getting their seed? Well, they're getting some seed from companies like ours. They're also working with public breeders, and those are breeders at universities, like the breeding program that is here in New York State at Cornell, University of Wisconsin, um, out west. There's still a lot of universities that have active breeding programs, and those breeders are developing varieties that then they're releasing through companies like Johnny's High Mowing, but then also even, you know, we at, 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 um, at Vitalis and Enza are also working with these breeders. So they're, they're, they're um, what's interesting about the work of these public breeders is that they're often really regionally based, and they're often working on projects that are um, not as broad in scope as, say, the breeding programs of these large breeding companies, but they can be really relevant and useful for regional um, growers in their area. And then also over here you have the seed grower, so someone needs to grow all this seed, um, and that goes back to my original point, you know, some seed is grown organically, some green seed is grown conventionally. Companies like our company, Vitalis, works with seed growers to produce our seed, but then also these retail seed companies are working with seed growers. And a lot of the OP varieties, the open pollinated varieties that you find in your seed catalog are being directly contact, contracted by these companies working with seed growers who are producing the seed for them. Um, and then, also, an important piece are farmer breeders. So, and Amy's going to probably talk more about this, but there's a lot of work being done with farmers who are learning to, to breed on farm, developing the varieties that are sp particularly adapted to their systems, but then also are, again, very useful for other farmers in the region. And this is a, um, a participatory breeding project. Often they're working also with public breeders and developing also some really innovative varieties. And again, then these often also then get distributed through these retail seed companies um, as well. And then all of the seed then is getting, finding its way to farmers, to gardeners, and then also to companies that are maybe just selling seed packs that you might see in a hardware store, like um, a Seeds of Change or um, Burpee or something like that. So it's sort of a complicated picture, but um, it's important to understand it. Does anyone have any questions about this? Yeah. Um, well, as soon as that seed is grown in an organic system, then that seed can be certified organic. So as long as, so if a farmer were to um, get a variety from a seed company and say they save the seed of it and their seed, they, their, their farm that they're saving that seed on is certified organic, then that seed would be considered organic. It doesn't, it doesn't take multiple years if it's grown in an organic production system. No. Yes. So, so I, also in the organic regulations is that you can't have genetically modified varieties. So that would, I, I'm sorry, I should be repeating the questions. <laughs> so the first, um, the first question was how long does it take um, for a conventional seed to be um, turned into organic seed when it's grown on farm? And, the, and that was my answer. It only takes one year. Then the second question was, um, if, does, does that same, um, hold, that same one year um, transition hold true if it's a genetically modified variety? And the answer is no, because you can't have a genetically, um, a, a variety can never be certified organic if it's genetically modified. Yeah. Where does the seed saver movement fit into this structure? Yes, that is part of it as well. And I would say that that's a good point. Um, and it would be, I would say it's another, set of arrows that would be coming from these farmers and gardeners um, that are then saving their seed. And then there's a great um, organization called the Seed Savers Exchange, but there are also other smaller organizations throughout the U.S. that really are working on 
not necessarily developing new varieties, but preserving all of the old, you know, the varieties, as Jason talked about at the beginning, you know, that, that have been passed on from generation to generation. And of course, that's a whole other really important pool of resources for farmers and gardeners. So farmers and gardeners that are saving their seeds, maybe they're just keeping them, you know, um, passing, you know, growing it in their farm and then passing, say, giving it to friends or perhaps they're sending a portion of their seed to um, an organization like Seed Savers that then is maintaining it as like a gene bank, um, as well as there's the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, there's Native Seed Search, there's, that's a whole other piece of it as well. But what I would say is that material doesn't tend to get back into the retail seed company except for, for instance, Seed Savers Exchange now has a retail catalog. <laughs> so it's complicated. Um, but that's also a really important piece of it. Yeah? Um, export production systems in developing countries tend to focus on conventional varieties, conventional systems, and I wonder if you know of any projects or efforts to sort of share in the, uh, the capital of organic or over-pollinated seed in developing countries. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. There's an organization. Wait, wait um, sorry, the question was... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for getting me. The question was, um, a lot of um, growers in other countries don't have access to um, organic seeds right now. A lot of the, ex the exporting of seed is with conventional seed, and what projects are happening to get the organic seed to growers in other countries, right? So that's the question. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an organization called the Experimental Farm Network, and they do partner with a lot of different um, or different countries that and they grow out the seeds and send them back. I think they did some stuff with uh, different parts of Africa. Oh. <laughs> we're There's trying, white people, we're trying. Do I to speak into it? There's an organization called the Experimental Farm Network, and they have a website, but they also grow out like different varieties from different countries, especially like war torn, -torn countries, and they grow out the seed and send it back to them. So you can look into that. Yeah, and, and I think that there are also a lot of other grassroots, um, ha you know, happening. I, but I don't know any off the top of my head. But Yeah, if we exchange some contact information for anybody that's interested, there are a few organizations. I don't know the names, but I have a list I can share as well. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, oh, this doesn't work anymore. Okay. So um, I'll go through this really quick because I want to have time for the, um, the rest of my my cohort to get up here. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about what we do at Vitalis Organic Seeds. So again, to give you sort of a picture of what's happening with a global breeding company, um, and, and then we'll go into some of the other pieces of it. So Vitalis Organic Seeds is a Dutch company. We have four main activities that we focus on. Um, we're breeding and selecting organic varieties. Um, we're producing those seeds organically of the varieties that we develop. Um, we're working on organic seed treatments in certain crops, depending on um, the need for them. And then, of course, we're marketing and selling our varieties. So we do a lot of breeding. This is one of our breeders that's based uh, um, on our station um, in Holland. Um, and again, because he's breeding in organic systems from the start, um, those plants that he is selecting um, are already being adapted to organic systems. So he works on, this is red curry squash, so he's breeding specifically for virus resistance, which is a big issue, especially um, in that part of Europe, long storage, and of course, really good flavor. And then we have all of our breeding projects um, are focused on traits that are really critical for organic, organic growers. So cladosporium resistance, so if any of you are growing tomatoes in high tunnels, you probably know cladosporium. It's also known as leaf mold, and it's a prevalent problem um, in high tunnel production um, of tomatoes. And so we're working on developing varieties that have natural resistance to leaf mold um, because otherwise it's a really difficult disease um, for growers to control. Um, and then... We're also doing trialing, again, all over the world, and this is the work that I do. I'm based in Vermont, but I do trials throughout the East Coast. Of all the material coming out of our breeding programs, I'm trialing them on organic farms um, to, make, to be able to make selections among varieties to say, okay, this one is really working because it has the disease resistance, it has the flavor, it has the traits that are, I know organic growers are needing, or it doesn't, you know, it just doesn't hold up to the disease pressure, the flavor is not good enough, whatever it is that we're working on. 
Um, and we're doing this with 20 or so different crops that we work in. So then, oh, question. So the question was, are there um, any major efforts in breeding to um, address the issues that are now happening with climate change? And absolutely, it is um, a prevalent, um, very common dis discussion point in all of the breeding conversations that I've been in re recently with breeders in my country, at my, my um, company, but also I know this is an issue um, across the board. And it's really challenging because, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, um, the temperature, you know, temperatures tend to be warming. So, you know, maybe we're going to breed for, you know, increase, increased disease pressures that we know are, you know, um, aggravated by the heat um, or increased rainfall. But then you have, you know, you know, like some of the rain events that we had this year and, you know, places here in Pennsylvania where, you know, you're getting six inches of rain in a 24 hour period. Like how do you, how do you breed for that? Um, so it's, it's definitely a challenge, um, but it's something that I would say is on the minds um, without a doubt of, of breeders of all, from all different levels because clearly that's an issue that um, farmers are, are being more and more challenged by. Um, and you know, there's many different ways to think about it you now. So are, are we gonna be moving more of our agriculture into protected systems where you can sort of mitigate some of those issues um, but that, you know, is that really feasible? Is that economically feasible? Is that environmentally feasible? Um, so it's a big, it's a big challenge, um, but it's definitely a part of the conversation, yeah. So, so then seed production, of course, that's a big part of what we do. Um, and, you know, we have seed productions all over the world, and there's a number of different factors that go into what, why a seed is produced where. Um, the most important thing is really you want that seed to be produced in the best um, environment possible for that seed um, because you want um, high germinating seed, free of diseases, really, um, you know, strong vigor, which means that seed is really healthy. And so often, even though the breeding is happening in one part of the country or one part of the world, the seed is actually produced in a totally different part of the world because that's the best location to, to really get the best seed. Um, there's also issues of labor that become an issue, especially when you're dealing with hybrids. Um, some crops like pepper, all of those pepper, hybrid pepper seeds have to be hand pollinated. So it's really labor intensive. So you also need to find places where you can produce that in a way that doesn't make the seed um, cost prohibitive. So that's another factor. Um, and then also organic seed, of course, it has to be, we have to be fine locations that are organically certified. So that also goes into play when we're trying to figure out where we're producing our seed. Um, so these are just some pictures of seed production. Um, and then the next step is the logistics of the seed. Once that seed gets harvested, um, we still need to do a lot of work to clean the seed, um, to test the seed for any pathogens, um, test the germination. Often if um, the germination isn't as high as we would like or there's um, it, you know, other issues with the seed, it'll have to go through a couple rounds of cleaning and testing before it's good enough to be um, sold to our, to our customers. Um, and then packing the seed and then distributing the seed. So there's actually quite a lot of, of effort and infrastructure that's required to get that seed out of you know, the lettuce field in California where it's grown and then get that seed into packets sent to our customers, which in this case would be um, the, you know, a seed distributor, and then they are, then have to repackage that seed into their packaging to get it out to you. So um, you should, Keep that in mind when you're looking through your, your Johnny's catalog, and Johnny's is fantastic because you can order that seed one day, and the next day the seed is in, is in hand. Um, but think about all the steps that had to happen for that seed to arrive, you know, so that you can plant it in the, um, at, on your farm. It's, it's quite um, impressive when you really start to look at it. Yeah, go ahead. So given all those factors, I'm often amazed at actually how cheap a lot of seed is. Not yep. Right, right. So the question was, um, how you know how can seed be often very cheap, given all that has to go um, into getting the seed um, 
to the grower. And definitely there's an economy of scale, right, for sure. You know, you think about, yeah, one tomato that you pull off your tomato plant and how many seeds are in that versus how many seeds you get in a plant versus how many seeds. So there's that um, issue. Um, certainly some seeds are harder, much harder or easier to produce. And so you will see that in the seed prices, um, whether it's a hybrid versus an open pollinated seed, the quality of the seed. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot of different um, factors that, that go into what the cost of the seed is for you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to go through this quick because, so we have a lot of, we sell all over the world, but um, mostly um, um, Mexico, United States, and then in the, U, uh, in the EU. And then those are just some pretty pictures, which I don't know how well you can see with the lights, but. Um, okay. Next. We're done. Great. Yay. Okay. Well done, Adrian. Hey folks, so um, as I said earlier, my name's Amy Grondon and I am a commercial fisherman. And um, I work with the Organic Seed Alliance. I'm a member of their board. I'm currently serving as the vice president. Next slide. You might be wondering why is a commercial f uh, fisherman here talking to all of you are obviously land-based, um, land food growers. Um, I work really hard when I'm not on the water. I've been fishing since 1993 to make sure that there are fish the next season for me to come back and catch. I uh, work uh, with our management process, with other fishermen, with communities, NGOs, politicos, all to make sure we have the right environment so that the fish that I want to catch have the essential fish habitat that they need to spawn the next generation or otherwise do what they do so we can eat them. As such, um, I realized a while ago I could stop fishing on the water tomorrow and the way the environment is going, the things that we've done to damage it, even though we're trying to repair it, uh, climate change that we mentioned earlier and how it impacts seed breeding, all of those things will impact the fish and there's a very good chance those fish wouldn't survive if I stopped fishing them. It's particularly in the case of salmon because salmon are an anadromous species, meaning they return to fresh water after the saltwater life to spawn. So what I really need is the habitat that salmon return to to be the best quality habitat it possibly can be. Um, and to make that happen, I had an aha moment. I eat organic food. I should be supporting the farmers who grow organic food because of those standards that uh, were mentioned by Adrian, the, by the NOP, the National Organic Program. Uh, they demand that you folks as organic growers do certain things that are really good for the habitat and environment that my fish need. So as such, I decided I need to support my organic farmers. In Port Townsend, Washington, where I lived, is the home base of Organic Seed Alliance. And I've known some folks who have worked with them, got to talk to them, and um, ended up on their board. Silly me. So, but uh, next slide. But uh, through the course of that, I discovered that if I wasn't already a fisherman, I'd be a farmer like you folks, because I really enjoy working with them and the hard work, the work ethic, and many of the same challenges we face between commercial fishermen on the ocean and you farmers, where people who work in the environment to produce food a lot of it's way beyond our control, and we just have to see how we can make it work. And besides that, I like vegetables on the plate with my fish. So, Organic Seed Alliance, their, uh, their mission statement is uh, they're a non-profit organi organization with a mission to advance ethical seed solutions to meet the food and farming needs in a changing world. Uh, it's quite a mouthful, and so what does that really mean? Uh, next slide. So... As you can see up there, they believe that a uh, uh, seed is a cultural heritage. It's the right of all of us to have seed. It's not something that we should be patenting and that um, certain people can get and have. It's much like the fish that I catch. They are your fish as much as they're mine. I don't own them, and you all have the rights to them as well. So Organic Seed Alliance says it does a lot in their uh, work to um, make sure that we all have access to that and increase the amount of organic seed that is out there available to folks who want to have it. So. Um, just a little bit of a reader sometimes. So Organic Seed Alliance is also working to protect and extend, expand farmers' access to the seed that they need to produce the healthy organic food that, like I said, we all enjoy. So next slide. To do that, um, they're, uh, they work in three areas of research, and that's uh, education, policy, and research itself. 
So, and just to kind of comment that all these pictures that you see at the bottom are uh, different varieties of vegetables that Organic Seed Alliance has grown out uh, through variety tri trials or whether it's uh, their own breeding projects or with like folks like Adrian and other farmers like Jason. Um, and so these are some of the resulting things. Some of them in their final stages that are ready for sale and production and some of them that are still in the works such as the car uh, carrots, corn here. Next. So once again, we work in research, education, and advocacy. And then I'm just going to break each one of those categories down a little bit for you just to understand what some of our projects are. So right at the top, let's talk about policy because it's often the least fun thing to talk about when you're talking about farming and seeds. So it's uh, just like anything, we're only as good as the people who are representing us and helping us uh, make our lives, to fulfill our lives the way we want to do it in our lives and our style. So Organic Seed Alliance uh, spends a lot of time uh, working in Washington, D.C., as well as on local, regional, and state issues to make sure that we have uh, the space and time and things that we need to go out and grow our organic food. Uh, I've become much more politically involved as a commercial fisherman and now as a supporter of commercial uh, or organic growers. And you folks don't have the time to do it. You really need somebody who's supporting you, helping you, helping you disseminate the information that is really complex because you're good at being farmers and that's why you're farmers. It doesn't mean that you don't have the intellectual capacity to take on policy, but we all have so many other things we're doing. That's one of the things I love about Organic Seed Alliance. They're a watchdog group, uh, in fact, the, in the fact that they keep an eye on these things. They have uh, an amazing policy person, uh, Kiki, or, uh, Kiki Hubbard, and she works very closely on many levels, and I trust her information, and it helps me make the decisions that I need to make uh, regarding policy, and she helps me uh, let me know when I should contact one of my elected officials and how to move through that process so it's effective. So, and uh, one of the... Uh, <laughs> pieces that they've done is uh, the state of organic seed. They have released the first organic state of organic seed in 2011. Up at that, until that point, there's all this information floating around about organic seed, but we really didn't know like how healthy was it, how available was it, how important is it to you folks in the room, uh, what are the things you're looking for in it. So they conducted surveys, they did um, the like on-farm meetings with farmers, focus groups and all these different things to gather information across the whole U.S. about uh, what we think about organic seed. And that became the first uh, state of organic seed. It's a nice little fat document you can download for free online from the Organic Seed Alliance website, which is seedalliance.org. There's also an executive summary. A few years ago, um, as Adrian said, dude, like things are changing so quickly, the consolidation of seed industry and everything, that they revisited this and in 2016, an updated version was released. And um, just quickly, some of the findings that they took from that were organic farmers are planting more and more organic seed. Organic farmers are happier with the results of the organic seed they're using. Organic farmers believe organic seed is important to the integrity of organic food. More organic farmers are saving seed for them from, the, for their, from their own farms to sell. And organic, organic seed investments have increased tremendously. Also resulting from the uh, state of organic seed interviews, there are some challenges that still remain. And those, uh, some of the highlights of the challenges were most organic farmers rely on conventional seed still. The largest operations still use relatively little organic seed. Organic certifiers could do more to support organic seed. There aren't enough organic seed producers in, uh, available to meet the need, the need for organic seed. Organic seed research investments are insufficient. We need more money. This is where the policy part comes in and is very important because there's, we need to get in that farm bill some money to support organic farming and seed uh, development. And then uh, seed industries continue to consolidate and consolidate, giving us less options and less biodiversity in the seeds and the food that we need and eat. A few recommendations that came out of that report include invest more public and private dollars in organic seed research, train more organic farmers in seed production, and advocate for organic seeds. So these are, it's a really amazing periodic or, or report. I encourage you to download it and take a look. Keep it on your bedstand. Next side, next, there, put you to sleep. Uh, so then we do research as well. And uh, it's often hard in my mind to separate the research from the education because they do go hand in hand because we find often that we learn a lot from the people that we're trying to teach. And, um, and it all comes together in this uh, really great way. This is uh, just quickly, this is a, a couple of the staff at Organic Seed Alliance and in our field in Port Townsend. And I can't remember, I think we were evaluate, evaluating carrots and uh, that's some of the infield work. So when we do research with the Organic Seed Alliance, the thing that I like best about it is um, collaborative. They, they do all their work and research in partnership 
with farmers uh, who are working in their fields with uh, research facilities and um, PhDs who are uh, working on breeding. Uh, folks like Adrian, again, I keep going back to Adrian and Jason here, who are working in the, uh, the public sector. So it's a big com combination of the public and private sector working with the, the researchers there to grow out seeds along with the farmers and in your fields. Uh, the thing for me, when you work in the fields, doing it collaboratively, it's in real time and real conditions. And you don't have to go through any of those, um, I guess you weed out, to use a bad pun, a lot of those things that if a seed was grown in a laboratory or in a controlled situation, once it hit your field, it might not grow as well because it would just you know, freak out and be like, oh, this isn't where I'm supposed to be. And you might not have a good product, but when you work collaboratively with farmers in seed breeding, you, get a, you, um, you learn a lot of those things right away, like what are farmers looking for? What do you need when you harvest it? What's been successful for you or not? Uh, because quite honestly, sometimes researchers don't know what you folks really need in, in real world conditions. So I'm not sure I said that as well as I could, but we can talk about that later. So, so we also, um, we work on issues like, you know, that you are looking at, like Adrian said, the water. We consider like what pests are in your region. We consider like uh, what you have to deal with, so. Just make sure I got all these. Among these projects, uh, among this, there are projects that, uh, I think it's the next slide. Let's try it again. Yep. Uh, projects that we work in partnership, like I said, with research facility, researchers at different universities and uh, public breeders as well as the farmers. And so these are three examples of work that um, Organic Seed Alliance has been involved in. So the CIOA, the Carrot Improvement uh, for Organic Agriculture, is looking at carrots and different ways we can get uh, more nutrition, uh, better quality for those things, and uh, make them work for you in your um, in your region. We also like throughout all this breeding, uh, we look at flavor too because I think a lot of the conventional breeding they forgot to look at how things actually taste. So I think organic organic breeding is bringing a lot of flavor back to the food we eat, as well as all those strengths that we need in the production side of things like you, you farmers need. Uh, the Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative takes uh, vegetable varieties that have already been developed and they grow them out across the northern tier of the United States. And that's, uh, I'm going to forget someone in this, but we work with Cornell University and basically it would be with Jason too because you, I think you have some Novik crops yep. here. Yep. And then folks from Wisconsin and uh, Colorado, uh, Oregon State and in Washington State. So we take all these seeds and we all grow them out in our region and then get together and report back about our successes and failures and challenges in growing them so you understand how those things are working across the northern tier in all these different regions and uh, what we can share and what is actually going to work for all of us. So. Uh, culinary Breeding Networks takes a step farther and includes the people who actually cook for the food. So uh, Lane Selman from uh, Oregon State University has this amazing program where she's uh, brought chefs into the, in the arena with the farmers when we have a finished product and we get to taste it and they cook with it and give feedback because once again, if it's not something that we can cook with or eat, it's not going to sell regardless how great it grows in the field. So, next. And then education, like as I said, research and education um, often go hand in hand. So once again, all of the work is done in the field, except when we have to get together in a situa like, situation like this to review where we're at and our successors and failures. So some of the ways that uh, our education takes place are actually working with farmers in the fields to uh, regra regain the lost art of seed selection, uh, plant breeding and seed selection for the best crops. And uh, the consolidation of our food system Basically, over the last two decades, I think most people, have, or farmers have lost that knowledge about how to do it successfully because it is more than just like hanging it in your barn and, and using it the next year. It's like to me as a fisherman, I'm learning all these things. So um, we have uh, also do like host conferences and webinars and uh, we do them in Spanish often, which is great, which I think is very exciting to have the bilingual aspects of things coming in. I'd like to see us move into working with folks so we could get them in other languages as well. Two really exciting, important conferences that um, are hosted biennially in the same time slot in February that Organic Seed Alliance helps to host are, one is the, uh, called Organicology, and that brings together, much like the Culinary Breeding Network, it brings the distribution and the chef's uh, sector in with the farmers and the growers, and this conference talks about our, our food as a bigger whole and how it happens to get from the field to your, uh, the plate of the eater and all the things that happen in between and the issues that we all face and it helps to build a better communication across the whole sector of how we get our food to our people. The one that's held on the off year from that is called, uh, it's, uh, um, it was a brainchild of the Organic Seed Alliance and it's the Organic Seed uh, Growers Conference and that uh, gets really down and deep and geeky and it's really awesome because you bring together an incre incredible group of researchers 
with farmers who uh, otherwise wouldn't be able to hang out for 72 hours together and talk to each about their issues and problems. And through there, there are like uh, intensive of uh, different pro uh, projects. So if you go, you. Boy, it's just I can't say how exciting it is and the things that people learn and the contacts that you make. It's, it's a really, it's a fun time. It's a really educational experience and I highly recommend looking into two of those. The hard thing is they're both hosted in Corvallis, one in Corvallis, Oregon, the other one in Portland, Oregon, so it could be a challenge from the East Coast, but very much worth your time and I think there's scholarship money available for those as well. So, next slide. Oh, this is it. I'm done. Okay. But um, this one, I just, I don't know if you can see this, but this is one I wanted to call to your attention. We were prepping for one of our field days in uh, Port Townsend, and this is a carrot. I can't remember. The, it doesn't have a, not even named yet. It's so, so new. But when we were cutting them up, this devil appeared. It was like right around Halloween. It was kind of crazy that that just grew in there. So if anybody has a good name for this carrot, we're looking for a name for it. When it but unfortunately, the devil doesn't show up every time. It's like the only time it ever did it, but uh, there you go. So, and then I, I think we're having question and answer later, unless there's something somebody would like to ask now, I'd happily. I have a question mm -hmm. that I swung about, and maybe, maybe for Adrian, you might want to both answer this. Okay. Um, I'm a long time organic farmer, mm -hmm. and I'm just referring to your question that nobody should own seeds. And um, there's a lot of investment that goes into oh, absolutely. raising seeds, and, mm -hmm. I, and I, I've seen that in my career, you know, I, I, I was in farm management, so I worked for companies that took seeds that they weren't supposed to grow out and said, you know, to the seed supervisors, we have, we have a special farm where we grow out seed that we're not supposed to grow out, and basically steal the seed. Mm -hmm. And, and what, where, you know, they, they, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I, I worked so closely, I thought I bought so much seed, I worked closely with the seed companies. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to repeat the question and then suggest that maybe we move that question to the first, maybe the first question we address in the uh, question and answer session, because that is a really big one. And uh, it'd be great to get through Jason's and hear what he has to say. But the question was basically, uh, I made a comment that uh, seed is a public property and that um, shouldn't be owned by any one individual. And the question was, what do you do and how do you, I think I'm capturing this, reward the people who have worked really hard to breed a new, a new seed and how do you, how can you still make a living and be fair and equitable with seed, but still compensate the folks who put a lot of time and effort into producing it and new varieties? Is that the, a good capture? Okay, so we'll talk about that. If you don't mind, could we do that after? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So the question was if the Culinary Breeding Network is ava um, available and works on a national scale. And yes, recently they have moved to a, a bigger national scale. They just uh, this fall had their first uh, event where they brought together East Coast farmers with, and actually national farmers in New York City together with New York City chefs. And they did one of their presentations and it, I hear it was very successful. Uh, does Lane have a website for, yeah. she does? There just is a website Google. for the Culinary Breeding Network. Yeah. Uh, breeders, Breeders Net Breeding Network, and you can check it there. But um, as far as resource, she's a great grant writer. I'm not sure what you're looking for, and there may be or may not be money available. But Lane Selman is the name of the person you should contact to, and she's at Oregon State University. And Google the Culinary Breeding Network. Yeah. Thank you. That was very good. Thank you. Hello again, everybody. Um, just to lightly touch on the question that that gentleman had over there. I think it ties to everything that we're trying to talk about here today. So not black and white. The answers aren't black and white. There are ways to get compensated and respected for the work that you do in the development of a variety that doesn't squeeze out the evolution of that variety 
and the research that could be helping other people over time. Things like MTA agreements and things that public universities use to protect. So a public university will create a variety and then public universities do not sell seed. They're not in the business of selling seed. They don't want to compete in the marketplace. But those varieties can go out into the marketplace and be sold by private companies. So if you're working on something, any of us uh, that are on the farm, on the ground, working on something, you can, you can create strong and respectable partnerships with people that you can be compensated for the creation that you made without the restriction of others evolving that variety over time and also getting some compensation that makes sense for the work that you did. So this is how our public system currently works, actually, is that there, a lot of the compensation is coming in from a percentage of royalty given for the development of a variety. And that's one system. That's one way that this has worked. So I think the evolution of this is really important, and that means getting feedback into what is proper compensation for that work or proper perpetual compensation for that work. I mean, we see it in other industries, the music industry and such. So, I mean, there's, there's ways to evolve it, but there's also things in place right now that can give, give you that, that credit and, and give you the incentive to continue to do things like that if you have done that. So that's kind of where we're going to build on from here. So, um, you know, I just want to touch, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share this because what I'm going to be sharing is kind of this, you know, the practical application on the farm. Now here at Stone Barns, we do a lot of what we call experimentation. And this idea of experimentation kind of falls into a few buckets. So don't get scared by that word, just like genetics. There's a lot of ways to look at it. So experimentation, we're looking at the basics, crop trialing, varieties that are already established, varieties that are probably pretty good, but trying them out in our farm, in our system, in our region, to share that information with farmers, chefs, the public, everybody to be involved in that. And looking at them ourselves and deciding which ones are the best for our system. Um, we also, on the opposite side of that spectrum, are doing some on-farm breeding here, which is extremely exciting. And sometimes that takes the, the, the torch and runs with it because that's so exciting, right? Like, you're, oh, you guys are doing breeding on the farm and I could never do that or that's so exciting. But where we're doing the breeding, I think, is going to, you know, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to touch home with a lot of you because it's, it's a lot of stuff that we're doing. It's very doable. So we're looking at this idea of, like, where do you decide how to do work with seed? It's not all or nothing. It's not all hybrids, it's not all OPs, it's not all heirlooms, it's not all global seed production, and it's not all local seed production. So we're actually creating a system here that's been evolving for the 15 years that the center's been open that has found actually a place for all these different pieces to actually play a role. And so we really feel that all of you that are farming and eating can find a role for all these things too. And it's really, really important, so I'd love to touch on some of the reasons why uh, if you wouldn't mind helping me out. Oh, it was so good on the computer. You could really see it. You guys, it would have been like, oh. um, so everyone close your eyes and I'll describe all the photos that we're going to be going through. Yeah, you should turn the lights down. But I'm here now, so <laughs> here's, the, here's the why. Uh, diversity is the key. Okay, so the idea here is Diversity is the key to a good soil system as well, to soil health, crop rotations, movement. But it's also really good uh, from a variety standpoint as well. It's also really good from an economic standpoint. The thing I love about this idea of agroecology or this idea of diversified farming systems is that it's like all the things that are good are a win. Like, oh, it differ differentiates you in the market which gives you an economic benefit, but it's also really good for the soil. Like how, you know, it just feels good to do this work. And involving seed in this conversation is extremely important. So here you can see a number of different uh, cherry tomatoes. So diversity is the key, not settling on one variety. This is something that we really try to instill in everybody that comes here is don't get sucked into the sun gold hole. Don't just stay in one place. It's an incredible thing. But there's also you know, something to be said about saturating a market. And this is another place where uh, seed can really help. It can help all of us differentiate. It can open up doors to new customers. It can open up doors to new communities. Right? So you can use this as a tool in any way you want to reach the clientele that you want to reach. Um, and so some of the bullets up here. 
Staying ahead, I think, is super, super important. If you're farming, staying ahead, meaning what are we staying ahead of? We're staying ahead of that saturation. So we're staying ahead of discontinued varieties. Anybody here ever go through that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple laughs. You know how tough that is, right? Discontinued varieties, crop failures, that happens all the time. Where are you going to turn to next? Well, if you're not continuing to stay ahead, if you're not doing that research, then you're kind of doing yourself a disservice. Um, but with that, okay, what else is in the why? It's to build trust, to build trust to this community of seed savers, whether it's yourself, whether it's a global seed partner, whether it's a regional seed partner, whether it's with a university. I mean, this whole thing is about trust because there's been a lot of, let's say, loss of trust or trust or confusion around what to trust. Can we trust this genetic development? Can we trust a modern variety? What is a modern variety? What is going on? So building trust is building communication and it's building that connection to people that are doing seed work. Now here's another fun thing. People involved in seed are, how do I put this? They are amazingly focused in a way that is so incredible because to work on a variety or a crop it, these things take years to develop. It doesn't just happen in one shot. So you're talking about people that are spending 15, 20, 30 years on one crop, maybe one variety of something. That's a lot of time to spend, right? There's a lot of weird things those people know about those crops and their <laughs> genetics. And finding those things out is fascinating. So these are the things that you can tie into. There's not a million people out there in our country working on cucumbers. There's a few. And it's amazing what you can learn about cucumbers from those people that are devoting their whole lives to it. They're paying all their bills on cucumber money. This is an amazing thing. So these are great resources to tap into. And then the last thing on the why is, well, it's kind of why, but the percentage. So this is the thing too, don't get scared. Percentage, it's a personal choice. It's all about choice. Where can you fit this in? I say that if you're thinking about staying ahead, then every one of your crops should have something some percentage, whatever feels right, in pursuing what's coming next, what may disappear, or what can be better. I mean, we can't all just say that we're kind of at that perfect place. I mean, I don't think so about any of these crops or any of these varieties. Because as we were tying in this question about climate change, the way I think about the answer to that is seed is like the ultimate, <laughs> seed is always thinking about climate change. Seed is always thinking about environmental change all the time. So even if you're saving that heirloom that you want to protect from everybody and every generation, you know, you want to keep and preserve, there's something that's evolving with it. It's constantly moving. You could argue that the heirloom is not really what it, it is. It's not really preserving something from the past. It's evolving something from the past into a new space. Otherwise, it's going to stop working. And that's why working with people that are trying to evolve seed is really, really important because as farmers and as customers, I mean, you can't always, or gardeners, you can't always do that work. So finding people to, to help evolve those things is really, really important. So we're going to look at some of those examples where that can evolve. And if anybody has any questions, please just raise your hand. So we should also just guess what, what's on the screen. We're doing a guess because you can't see it. But so here, let's go to the how a little bit. So the how is the collaboration. Maybe you've bought into what we're saying and seed is really important. And now you want to figure out how to apply this to your farm. Well, I think you've already heard a lot of you know, interesting ways, right? No, knowing the education, knowing the industry, knowing what's out there, knowing what choice you're actually making. Open up a catalog. Are you buying a seed that's being produced locally? Are you buying a seed that's being produced globally? Who's responsible for that seed? Is it the seed catalog that you opened or is it ends are vitalis, or is it a public breeder that was doing research for OSA? I mean, these are all important pieces of information to know. And they're not always readily available. Most catalogs you open up, you're not going to find out the trajectory that that seed took. Sometimes you will, but not always. So it's important to kind of dive deeper. So partnerships are great, staying in tune. Um, trial and error is going to be a big, big part of this, right? Um, what we do here on this farm, may not work on your farm. You know, that's always the case, right? Everybody says that. You don't need to hear that. But trying things out and figuring out where the work you can do with seed is crucial. Um, so let's, there it is. Sun gold is back. <laughs> Anybody not know the sun gold tomato in this room? It's OK to not know it, but OK. So this is a really popular tomato um, that a lot of growers are growing. 
Um, but it has some interesting, unique qualities to it. It's really bad at storage, has super high sugar content and really thin skin, things that make it delicious to a lot of people. Um, but all those things combined mean it doesn't do well from the farm to the market. But it's still a great variety. But the reason I bring this up is because what's behind this seed? Who is involved in this seed? And this is something that we really cherish as farmers here at Stone Barns and what we want to kind of share with you is this idea of like chase that story, tra tra trace that story back and find out where these things are coming from. Again, the information can be difficult to find, but it is possible to find it. And so what can you uncover when you figure out that, when, that, when you follow that track? So Sun Gold, it turns out there's a Japanese breeder producer, a company, uh, uh, I'd say the similar style to Enza and Vitalis, that is currently responsible for this seed. I would say they are the sole distributor of this seed as far as we're aware. Um, so in understanding that, we were able to speak to the company. In speaking to the company, we were able to find out well, you may, this is pretty amazing. What else do you do? And then it turns out that they do some pretty amazing stuff, and it ties to similar to what's going on here. So this isn't good for conventional industrial farmers trying to ship tomatoes all over the country and internationally. But it's really good locally. It's really good small scale. It is a differentiator why people go to the farmer's market, because they know they're not going to get this at big supermarkets. Forgetting names. I've been farming too long. Um, but here, look at this. So this is what we uncovered. This is exciting. And you can't see it, but this is exciting. So <laughs> up here, this is purple maibuna. And over here are a, a wawasai, a mini Napa cabbage. What's exciting about this is these were varieties developed for flavor, developed for high efficiency, high intensity systems, small scale systems. You could plant, on a 30 inch bed, you could plant seven of these Napa cabbages basically on top of each other, four by three, and they will do fine. No bolting. You can grow them in the summer. You can grow them in the winter. If you want to see them, we're growing them right now down in the greenhouse, and they make me smile every time I walk past them. The purple maibuna is this beautiful, beautiful mustard green. Um, the only maibuna I ever knew about was this kind of broad green leaf, but it turns out that there's this purple that they've been working on. Now, one of these is, is currently available, only over the last few years has it become available. The other one is something new that isn't quite available yet. It is available commercially, but no seed company has picked it up. So the work we think is really important is know what's out there, know what's coming, know what else can differentiate yourself. Turns out that these two are two of the best things that we grow, two of the things that our customer right now is getting really excited about, whether it's the CSA or whether it's Blue Hill in this instance. They're getting really excited about something different. And we can only find that by tracing this story back. Because in the sea of vegetables that you find in these seed catalogs, how do you know which ones you want to grow? So I think. I have a question about So yeah. for the Mabuna, are you doing like a trial for the company itself, or do you actually buy the seed from a distributor? Great question. So the question was um, are you doing a trial for the seed producer, or are you buying the seed? Um, now that's a great example. I planned that. Um, because it's, it's both situations. Purple Maibuna is essentially an unnamed variety that is not available yet, so we couldn't buy that seed anywhere, even though we would want to. What we were able to get is a small sample packet, or a few small sample packets, in exchange for feedback, in exchange for our response and our sharing of how that worked on the farm. The Wawasai is available commercially, and so we didn't have to get free seed because we want to support that system. We bought the seed, which is reasonably priced, and we got it from Osborne Seeds. Um, so some are available, some are not. But these relationships it, it are really important to develop because it's not just about getting free seed. As we spoke about, seed isn't exorbitantly expensive, but quality seed is extremely important. So it is important to get free seed in exchange for trialing when you want to explore what's coming. Because why is that important? That's important because when the thing you love disappears, or when you stop loving the thing that you love in that catalog, and you want to go to the next thing, yes, it's exciting to look at the new section, the new for 2019 in all the catalogs, but there's also a little bit of uncertainty if you haven't grown it. So what I love is opening the new for 2019 and seeing a variety that I've had some experience growing for a few years, and so that I can grow that in quantity 
in my production system where, again, I don't want to put a lot of risk into it, but I've been able to try five, 10 plants. Maybe it's moved up to 20 or 30% because it's been so good. And now it's available, and now it can be my production variety. And then I can start looking for new ones to put in place for the trial. So you get ahead of the curve by doing that. And you want to find the right relationships for that. Oh, yeah, definitely. And that can feel really overwhelming. Yes. And I don't really know how you organize that if you don't have a manager for each of those departments. I'm going to do that for all of my departments. So how do you figure out what, what crop can work for all of your outlets? And how do you stay on the edge of each? Definitely. So the, the question is kind of like, how do you manage this? It feels a bit overwhelming to grow a large number of varieties because um, maybe you don't have a lot of people that can keep track of that data. Um, my short response to that is I think the system that we're using is applicable. And again, this is about percentage. This is about, um, I mean, if at the end of the day you need two varieties or three varieties of tomatoes and you know which markets they're going to, then you got to split them. You got to know the know the yields you're going to get, know the production you're going to get, and you got to split those up accordingly. If you don't know, you want to, I mean, you, again, I don't know your market, so which one is the one that you rely on the most to keep yourself afloat? And then you want to try, I'm saying, some of the things we try, five plants. Five plants can go a long way because you want to get acquainted with this variety, but also you don't want to show up on somebody's doorstep with a new thing telling them how great it is. Right? That's the biggest thing is that we, we work, you know, samples, communication, um, trying small amounts, sacrificing those five plants of that cherry tomato to try something new, even if it's three. You know, I mean, even just the new ones on this end of the row, then you have your production and then another new ones on that. So there's no chance of them crossing into each other so you don't get confused. But you got to start small like that. I, I mean, I don't know if that's... A, as exciting of an answer as you wanted, but really that incremental step is huge. And then also that engagement with the clientele is really important too, which it sounds like you have. I don't know if that's super helpful, but pieces of that can be helpful. Um, so right here, so I, I guess we'll go through this a little quickly, but I wanted to like build up. All right, so we got a couple minutes. So we're just gonna go through and build up. What we're gonna build up is take a bit of what we were talking about earlier so looking at the entire industry, and now where does that fit into the farm? So here's a couple of examples. Regional partnerships. So here is something you may all be familiar with, the Davignon radish or the French breakfast radish. So we started to do work. We wanted, we found the tops were pretty floppy or there was kind of inconsistency among all these. This is an heirloom variety, an old variety. So there wasn't as much consistency as we wanted. So we decided to go do some of the work ourselves. What that means is we plant densely plant a 30-inch bed top with the heirloom seed. We grow it out, and we choose the top 250 of those roots not to sell, but for seed saving. But there's a few thousand of those roots in the bed. So when you look at the numbers, it's loss, but it's calculable. It's, it's, a, it's an educated loss there. It's something that is worth it because now we're going to improve the variety. And everyone's got to find your own line with that. So we take these 250, and I mean, even though you can't totally see it, you can see here. So this is some of the selections that we've made, and this has been going on for probably six or seven years. Um, th it's really amazing how much faster they can grow, how much stronger they look, the color's more vibrant. So we're really excited with the improvement of this variety right here on this farm. So genetics are evolving here on this farm, but we're partnering with a local seed company, Fruition Seeds, based in Naples, New York, so further upstate by a few hours, they're actually a seed company that's doing seed production. 
So now here's where you make the economics work, right? If we grew this seed on our farm, we're going to have to take a loss not only for removing those roots, we're going to then have to take some kind of loss by selecting a section to grow those out to flower and all the challenges that come with taking a seed, as Adrian mentioned, all the way to seed. It's, it's risky. So in this instance, we found a partner who wants to do on-farm breeding and their home scale seed production. So long story short, we pick out our top roots. It's a selection that we make, the chefs make, the farm team's making with us. We get our top 250, we send them to them. They then grow it out. Seed is exponential. They send us more seed than we even probably need, and they have their seed as well. So this is a great way to partner on-farm breeding. So, so again, it's resilient in your system and in your region, and it's also being produced in your region. So that's one example. I think I can do these pretty quick. Okay, public breeders. Um, land grant universities, so this is something really good to keep up to date with. There are grants that are being written all the time and being awarded all the time, but there's not a ton of them. But these, when these grants get written, they're, 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 there's a farmer component usually written in. Breeders are generally doing this kind of research to be able to, to get farmers involved in the process. You can be one of those farmers today. Sign up now. No, but you can. So finding out those grants. Um, and supporting that too. This is our public system. So in your region, there's public land grant universities that have public money and grant money that are here to help you. So finding those relationships. If you're in New York, Cornell University uh, and the University of Wisconsin are doing great work um, in the Northeast region. Um, so we, we do partnerships like that. Tying back quickly to the idea of climate change, well, this variety is a cucumber and it's called Early BW Hybrid right now. That's its working title. Early BW is an early cucumber that's bacterial wilt resistant. Bacterial wilt is an important disease that's becoming more prevalent up in the Northeast and has been prevalent down South for a long time because the cucumber beetle is a vector for this disease. So you see those cucumber beetles out there and then all of a sudden your plant goes from this beautiful strong plant to a completely wilted plant as it sends that virus through uh, through the water uh, entering into the plant. This is a resistant variety, and so we're in the stage of trialing it as a part of a grant with Cornell University. So we get the seed in response, we give them feedback to it, and we get to explore what it's going to be like before it hits the market, or hopefully helping get this to the market so that we can all access it, so you can be a part. Um, I guess we can just go through because we're out of time. Uh, let's, yeah, let's keep going. That's public breeders. One more. Intermediaries. So this is a great one. So now take it one step further, right? That's too much. Getting involved in grants, that's a lot. Getting, um, you know, finding a local seat, there's a lot to that, right? Your transfer, you don't want to get rid of your product. Well, here's where you can get involved in a very simple way with the intermediaries. These are some of the seed catalogs that you're buying from. What we've done is go and develop a relationship with those seed companies and learn about the work that they're doing. Just like farmers, seed companies need to figure out what they're going to put into that catalog. Part of that decision comes from maybe they're growing it out. Companies like Johnny's and High Mowing and Territorial Seeds are all growing out the varieties that are in that catalog that you're looking at. But they also want farmer feedback to figure it out because we are going to be the customers. We're going to be the people growing this stuff. So you can get involved in variety trials. And what we do there is also taste tests, you know, not just growing something that looks beautiful, but getting the whole farm team, getting your customers involved, getting the public involved, whoever you're engaging with the most at a farmer's market stand doing taste tests. So what you can sort of see here is these are about 10 different varieties of squash and maybe 10 or 12 varieties of tomatoes. These are our standard tried and true varieties compared to the new stuff that we've never seen before. Some have numbers, some have names. Um, and so we do these taste tests so we can really get a feel for something. And obviously one year is not going to tell you everything, but if you fall in love with something, that gets you to do it the next year, and then when it's in the catalog, you're, you're ready for it, or you know that's what you want to bring to market. So working with those people is really important. Okay, last sentence. Breeder producers, let's do this one. Um, all right, well, here's a great example. So in these, in these taste tests, um, this is some escaroles and frisés, something that our market wasn't ready for a few years ago, the bitterness, the challenge to that. But we wanted to keep growing them so that we would have you know, more diversity in that lettuce rotation of our crops. 
And so we learned how to evolve our growing practices by speaking to breeders, speaking to other farmers. And you can't see it now, but like it's this bright yellow blanching is just so incredible. And it's a combination of the right breed and also the right uh, finishing technique, which we've gotten really good at, but it's taken years of small percentage. Just a few escaroles and trying it out and learning and then getting better at it. And now we can grow whole blocks of it, which is really amazing. But what's exciting here is trying out these different varieties and these being specific organic varieties, working with the breeder producer. So I called Adrian and asked, you know, hey, you guys do amazing work with lettuce, like amazing work with lettuce. Are you doing any work with escarole and, and frisee and endive and things like this? And Adrian had a few varieties for us to try. One of them right here in the middle, we fell in love with instantly. It does an incredible, this is good feedback for you. It does incredible <laughs> self-blanching. Benefine does incredible self-blanching, but then when we tie our, ours up and do our own technique, it's even better. So here's a variety that we were super excited to, to share and learn from, get some sample seed. Now it's actually available, I saw yesterday, in Johnny's catalog. So now we're going to be able to purchase this seed in a couple weeks. So just the evolution of that process. So time is up, so now we'll yeah, get an announcement. Yeah.